uh, when in fact he's actually playing into God's hands. He's providing that absolutely essential opposition in all things that, that allows us the full exercise of our agency. And he's right there in verse 5, chapter 3 of Genesis, uh, wherefore ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Uh, Satan loves to mix truth and, and, and falsehood in, in getting us to, to do things uh, that are, are wrong. Uh, and in this case, he, 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 he was telling truth mixed with falsehood. What symbol does he use to give validity to uh, his uh, um, enticings, to his temptings? He uses the symbol of the serpent. Mm -hmm. Why do you suppose Satan uses the symbol of the serpent to give validity to uh, his his false plan, his his attempt to derail Heavenly Father's plan. What what else is uh, symbolized by the serpent? You're probably thinking of when the children of Israel are being led by Moses and the fiery flying serpents come and are biting them, and Moses raises the brazen serpent. The brazen serpent, which the Book of Mormon tells us clearly is a type for Christ. Yeah. And and and, the, and even earlier than a Book of Mormon oh, times, you remember yeah. what happens in Pharaoh's court. What's what's what does God tell Moses to use as the symbol of his authority? He takes his staff, casts it down. It becomes a serpent, and it swallows up the other false serpents of the magicians in Pharaoh's court. And, and that's particularly symbolic there, in that the symbol of royalty for a pharaoh is a. Uraeus serpent, a, a that's right. on his headdress, that's, right. that's the symbol, that's right. so he's, he's taking over the, the uh, royal authority. And, and, I, and I find it so interesting that chapter 3, verse 1 of Genesis says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field, uh, and it is in fact that b what we're really saying is that Satan is more subtle than anybody else, and he's using the symbol of the serpent because that in fact in ancient times was a symbol of royalty, kingship, and messianic power. And what Satan is doing now is he's coming among Adam and Eve and saying to them things that only the Messiah can say. He's promising them things that only the Messiah can promise. You shall not surely die, but you'll be, of course, as the gods. Well, Satan can't bring that to pass. Only the Messiah can. But he wants Adam and Eve, our first parents, to think that he has that same power as the Messiah. And that, that's really a parallel with uh, going back to Moses chapter 1, when Satan appears to Moses, he's, he says, I am the only begotten, worship me. Uh, he, he's trying to usurp that authority of Christ when he has yeah. neither the power nor the ability to, to uh, fulfill on any promises that he gives. That's, that's a modus operandi for this, for this being. And it's like uh, he was over Faust in a conference uh, talk in which he talked about Satan as the great imitator. But he does the same thing in the very next chapter, or at least in the book of uh, Moses in chapter 5, when he appeared, uh, to, or at least when he came among the sons and daughters of Adam, the first thing he says to them is, I am also a son of God. Yeah. I'm, worship me. Now, and, this interaction between Adam and Eve and the serpent brings about the fall. Talk to us for a minute about what the fall is and what it is not. What do we need to understand about the doctrine of the fall? I would say first and foremost we need to understand, uh, and, and this is in, in direct uh, contradiction to what most of the rest of Christianity and Judaism thinks of the fall, it is basically a fundamentally uh, important and necessary element. We, we Without the fall, none of us would be here. We would not be in a position to exercise our agency to the fullness necessary to develop ourselves to become like our Father in Heaven. And God planned it from the beginning. It wasn't something that caught Him by surprise yeah. and He had to come up with some kludge to, to fix it. But so so, so w what we're saying is, is that Adam and Eve uh, took into their bodies those elements which caused a change, a physical change, and introduced mortality into the world. They became mortal. They were non-mortal. They, they, they take into their system uh, things that cause a change, and they become mortal. And all things around them, including the whole earth, also become mortal. Is that not what we're saying with the fall? They, they Adam and Eve, in a sense, are the agents of change here. And we're going to take that second creation that you talked about, that spiritual, physical creation, 
and through their actions, the exercise of their agency, they're going to move it into this third creation, this fallen world that, fallen. as Mike said, is so critical and so important for the plan of salvation. And, and, and I think another point that, that uh, arises here is, you know, one might ask, well, why did God just put him in a state like that to begin with? Wouldn't that, that have been a whole lot easier than, than this, this whole uh, tortured, contorted way of, of bringing it about? Well, well but it, it wouldn't have accomplished his divine purposes. I mean, he's smart enough to figure out how to achieve his goals and objectives, and he can do anything that he wants. Sure. But it, it, it does not do for us what needs to be done, and that is testing and trying and sifting, and for us to act as agents. Wouldn't you agree? Absolutely, absolutely. Okay. You know, so many view Adam and Eve as the greatest scoundrels that ever walked the face of the earth, and you get the feeling that if they meet him in the next life, their first their first reaction would be to scold them. But what noble parents they must have been, how carefully they must have been selected to do this very, very difficult thing, and to make the right choices, having seen what was there, and, and to make this choice. And, and they understood. They understood the blessing that would come because of, 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 um, of their choice to uh, bring mortality into the world. I love the way it said in Moses chapter 5, um, when they come to, when this understanding reaches its fruition of, of what the, the fall did for them, it says, And in that day Adam blessed God and was filled and began to prophesy concerning all the families who were saying, Blessed be the name of God, for because of my transgression my eyes are opened, and in this life I shall have joy. And again in the flesh I shall see God. And Eve's wife heard all these things and was glad, saying, Were it not for our transgression, we never should have had seed, and never should have known good and evil, and the joy of our redemption, and the eternal life which God giveth unto all the obedient. It, it, it is interesting to me in those two verses how uh, we get a perspective on, on the man's personality versus the woman's personality. Adam is always first person, I shall have joy, I shall see God, and Eve talks about our transgression, we never should have known good, our redemption, and so on and so forth. There's, I think that there's a fundamental um, principle there, the way that, the, that men and women look at things, and, and, and I guess what I would say on top of that is that far from being the the scoundrel, the the the, the person who's responsible for the fall, Eve is to be praised. Absolutely. It wouldn't be the first time that a woman gave her husband a nudge in the right direction, and and I and I really do believe that that she, there comes a time when she sees sees things clearly and knows what has to happen, and then understands that they're not talking about just themselves; they're talking about all of their the posture, whole the, whole, yeah. the whole picture. That's, a, uh, that's exactly right. Quickly, how is the fall overcome? With the atonement of Jesus the Christ. Pillar. And we are not held accountable for Adam's transgressions. And, and in fact, I think there's a difference between transgression and sin. We are responsible for the sins we commit, but we ought to be grateful that Adam and Eve uh, made the choices that they did to introduce the fall uh, into the world so that you and I can be having this conversation today. Thank you very much.